the Lily of the Valley, the song we sang a while ago. The third stanza. With his manna he may he my hungry soul shall fill. Kind of stuck out when we seeing it. Uh, what kind of man are we? Well, we know the Israelites in the wilderness. God sent a manna that they were to collect six days. The last day they were to collect double portion. So the Sabbath, they wouldn't have to go out. You think they ever got tired of eating manna and quail? Yes. They gripe about it. Gripe about it. Well, they, they gripe the, when they longed to go back to Egypt where they could have what to eat? Meat. No. Flour. No. The vegetables from there. Well, uh, weedy. <laughs> weedy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you must think onions and garlic's weeds. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? That was what they ate in the land. That was promise. in the promised land, yeah. Although it took them 40 years to get there. I tell you what, I think we're going to really enjoy the study on King David. As I told you, this Power Lectures had this uh, theme. Back in 2008, it was Jess Whitlock that gave me this book. And it's a different way of studying uh, than I'm usually, uh, I go to a book and study each chapter, each verse, but it divides David's life into sections, and each one of them is titled with an S. Uh, Tonight we're going to look at David as the soldier of God. And it's going to be talking about how he had a courageous heart. But other chapters, he's, he's sovereign. What does sovereign mean? King. King, that's right. He, he'll replace Saul and become the great king of Israel. He will be a seer, S-E-E-R. What does that represent? Prophet. His prophecy is being inspired. Uh, as a shepherd, we think of Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, guess who wrote that? And we'll talk a little bit about him being a shepherd tonight. But uh, one chapter talks about his being a soulmate. What do you think that represents? Who was he so close to? Jonathan, they were knit. It says they, they had a bond. I just am, I'm amazed at how Jonathan accepted David, uh, who would replace his father. He didn't uh, get upset that he wouldn't be king. David as sinner, and who do you think of? <laughs> it's funny. Uh, one of the ladies' classes, her. Her subject was the lady who took a bath and dirtied a king. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was kind of humorous in one way. So, him as a servant. And then the last I'm going to look at, David, and this is just uh, in addition, uh, David and his wives. I think we can learn a lot. David and his wives? Wives. So, oh. look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 9. You know, last week, we, I preached a sermon, What is in a Name? You know, we, we uh, live a reputation. And we can uh, get a bad name if we do bad things. Or if we do good things, we'll have a good name. I saw uh, this illustration used in a lesson. Uh, it's easier to be good when I'm with you. 
think that is a good reputation? And I think of Eva. It was easier to, it was easy to love seeing her, being with her. Love the way she interacted with members of the congregation. By the way, let's encourage our members to come tomorrow if they're possible. But I'm going to try to put a notice uh, or plea or request in our Facebook uh, news page to get as many here tomorrow as possible. Um, 2 Samuel 7 verse 9. And I was with thee wherever you went, and I have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of great men that are in the earth. Who made David? Well, David has to be uh, willing. I don't think God can make anything out of us if we're a bump on the log, you know, if we don't have a mind to do it. Uh, think of the name encourager. Who do you think of Barnabas. in the New Testament? Barnabas. Barnabas. All right. Back in the Old Testament, who was called the friend of God? Your mother spit it out right quick. I bet she did. Yeah. <laughs> Abraham. Abraham. All right. Who was known as the man of God? Moses. Okay. And then David from... Uh, Acts 13, he was the man after God's own heart. What was the difference between Saul and David? In stature. Saul was a very tall man. Uh huh. And David was not. I'd say he was average height, but he was men small. Man, he found men small. Yeah. But who was the bigger man? Now Saul started off good, but he he got the big head, he got almighty in his mind, and he he was didn't. concerned about pleasing the people instead of God. Too, you know. Well, pleasing himself. I, well, yeah. maybe I guess. He, yeah, he wanted to make a big show. He offered a sacrifice that he shouldn't have made, as not being a Levite or uh, a judge, and he also. Uh, bringing back Agag, the Amalekite king, and yeah. and that the 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 beef, the the cattle. Uh, I'm gonna make sacrifice of them. I'll make a big show, and we'll have a big victory uh, feast. And you know, who gave them the victory? God. God. Yeah. Okay. Who was known for his wisdom? Okay. Who was known for his patience? Go. Go. And what was David known for? Having the kind of heart. God saw him and he... Man after God's own heart. Uh, that's right. In 1 Samuel 15, he says, David was better than Saul. Uh, and so tonight, a soldier, courageous heart, well, at the end of his life, as he's speaking to Solomon, look at 1 Chronicles 22. 1 Chronicles 22. Verse 13. Well, this is not the reference I was going to, but it's a, a similar thing. Then shall thou prosper if thou take heed to fulfill the statutes and the judgments which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage. Dread not, nor be dismayed. Now, I'm trying to find out who, the, who said it to who. Verse 6, 
Solomon is called. That'd be David talking to Solomon. Yeah, I guess it is. That's what verse 7 says. Because he's right. fixing to tell them about how he had gathered all the materials for him to build the house. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that too. Go to, go to chapter 28, verse 20. <coughs> David said to Solomon, his son, be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not. Nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. You know, in my mind I was thinking that you could find this phrase, uh, be, a, uh, be courageous and of good courage. No, be of... <laughs> uh, be strong, men of good courage. And I thought, boy, I'm going to find it where it's told several men of the Bible. But if I, I've only found it in representing Solomon. And it was said to Joshua. In three times in chapter 1 of Joshua. Uh, and I, I'm wondering if it was given to Joshua uh, to be strong and courageous because he, he replaced Moses. You know, think, I think uh, Moses' shoes would be hard to fill, wouldn't they? And although Joshua was there every step of the way with, with Moses, and he learned a lot from Moses, uh, when Moses went off to die, Joshua's, it's on his back. No wonder Moses told him, be strong, be of good courage. Uh, and so from the very beginning of David to the very end of David he was a man of courage think about him as a young boy go to 1 Samuel 17 1 Samuel 17 verse 34 now when God sent Samuel to Jesse's house David is, a, is one of eight uh, sons. 1 Samuel 17. And when his sons, Jesse's sons, are all going to battle against the, the uh, Philistines, Goliath, and so forth, where was David? He was with the sheep. I wonder if David ever thought, I'm left behind, I'm with these stinking sheep, I'd rather be doing something else. But we find him faithfully serving as God sent him to do. So 1 Samuel 17, 34. Here's David. He's, came, he's come to the battlefront. And he hears Goliath. And he's pretty upset about uh, the humiliation that Goliath is putting on the soldiers and his brothers and, and even King Saul. Uh, and Saul is asking him, what, what have you come here for? You're just a youth. Uh, David has already said, I'll fight this Goliath. But notice verse 34. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose up against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear in this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. What, what is David calling Goliath? An animal. In fact, a little bit later on, uh, Goliath looks down at David and says, What, have you come out uh, like you're coming out against a dog? Well, he called himself a dog. But... Uh, 
you know, here's the beginning of David's experience. Think about what he is going through and how it's preparing him. Everything that we go through in life, we're, we're staging something in the future for strength, success, victory. When we go through something, no matter how difficult, no matter alone, we're, our character is being built up. Our faith should be in God and not ourselves. So, whatever David had to, to face, you know, he wasn't a hireling and he wasn't a weakling. He protected the sheep. And so now, when he comes up against Goliath, go to 1 Samuel 15, 14. First Samuel 14, verse 23. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed over into uh, Bethavim. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eats any food until evening, that I may be avenged. I am at the wrong place. Let's see, 1423, I guess I am. On mine enemies, so none of the people tasted any food. And all they of the land came to the wood, and there was honey upon the ground. And when the people were come unto the wood, beloved, behold, the honey dropped. But no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. What was that oath? Don't eat. Don't eat anything. Notice what happens. But Jonathan heard, heard not when his father charged the people with the oath. Wherefore he put forth the end of his rod that was in his hand, dipped it in uh, the honeycomb, and put his hand to his mouth, and his eyes were enlightened. Strength renewed. A little bit of nourishment was all that was needed to, to help him recover a little bit. Then answered one of the people and said, Thy father strictly or straightly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man that eats any food that day. And the people were faint. Then said Jonathan, My father has troubled the land. See, I pray you how mine eyes have been enlightened because I, I tasted a little of this honey. How much more if happily the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found. And had there not been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines. And they smote the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajalon. And the people were very faint. And the people flew upon the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground. And the people did eat them with the blood. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I'd uh, ever be that hungry. We want to process the meat better than that. Uh, so here in the story against Goliath, the one occasion uh, of what happened there. Uh, one of the titles uh, that I've seen written about David's slingshot. It was the sling, the slingshot heard around the world when David sent that one rock in the forehead of Goliath. What does that remind you of? A shot heard around the world. How about Lexington, Massachusetts in 1775? 
500 colonial uh, men went up against the Redcoats. But because they were outnumbered, they were pushed back. But later on, at the North Bridge uh, in Concord, they drove the Redcoats back. But when that first shot fired, it started the battle, the Civil War, and you, hear, you have that Civil War? Uh, you mean the Revolutionary War? The Civil, yeah, Revolutionary War. Uh, I think when we th uh, consider David, it's important to see uh, all the people <clears throat> related to him. His relatives, Obed, was his grandfather. You know who his great grandfather was? Boaz. Who did Boaz marry? Ruth. Ruth. So the great grandmother of David was Ruth. Uh, he was sent to keep the sheep, 1 Samuel 16, verse 11. <coughs> and when God sent Samuel to Jesse's house to select a king, I think there is a reason. And of course, none of the older brothers fit the category and so forth. Uh, I think, let's go back to uh, 1 Samuel 17. Here's the real first battle as a soldier. He's not really in the army, but he volunteers. What's his impression when he hears the, the loud Goliath shouting to the people? What's the proposal? What does Goliath say to the Israelites? You send uh, a boy to... You send your... You're a fighter, and fight me. And that's the only fight. If he beats me, the Philistines will be your servants. But if I beat you all, then it'll be the other way around. And who volunteers? Nobody. Nobody. Even King Saul is scared of this giant. Now, how tall is he? James Savage sat there at 4 o'clock and says, well, how tall was he, really? The, uh, Look, it, it was 7.3 feet tall or 7.4 feet tall, Goliath was. Well, it's taller than that. Nine foot nine. Nine foot nine yep. is, oh, is okay. what some, but look at verse 17, verse uh, four. Yeah. And there went out a champion of, of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Point your finger, go from there to the bend of your elbow, that's a cubit. And each cubit was fashioned according, according to the king. So if the king's arms were long, a cubit was longer. But if a king was shorter, that's the standard. So it was anywhere from 18 to 20 inches uh, a cubit. Plus a span. Span is uh, the width of one's hand. So uh, around nine foot, close to ten foot. Uh, that's uh, a man coming into our houses. He's going to be hitting the, the ceiling. Uh, walking under the, the door or getting in the door, he's going to have to stoop down. We Notice, used to have a member yeah. here that was tall enough that he had to duck under the doorways. Really? A member? Yeah. Uh, basketball. There was a basketball player, seven foot ten, that was too tall. They wouldn't let him play. <laughs> uh-uh. Yeah. Just, I forget where that was. Uh, anyway, look at the armor that he's wearing, the coat of mail, you know, the chain where if he gets shot with an arrow, it don't go in. It weighed 5,000 shekels, about 125 pounds. Oh, and remember Saul? Well, well, David, if you're going to go up 
uh, in the battle against uh, Goliath. Here, let, let me put my armor on you. Well, this kind of proves to me he wasn't a boy. We don't really know how old he was at this time. Could have been a teenager, young man. But here's uh, uh, King Saul's armor being put on him. And it, it fits him, but not. It's, it's too large for him. He's, and David says, I'm not used to this. I can't use it. Uh, and he, he wanted to fight like he knew how to fight against the lion and the bear with a slingshot. The, his staff, saw, uh, glass staff, spear staff was like a weaver's beam. And the head weighed 600 shekels and, was, and a shield went before him. That, that head of that spear was 15 pounds. Mm. You know, in track, shot putters, let's say they, they threw one that was 12 pounds and one that was 15 pounds, I think. A small one and a big one. Uh, this guy could... Oh. He, he was a warrior. And everybody was scared of him. But you, you go to the uh, story of how he comes against uh, Goliath. I love what he says in verse 45, chapter 17. Then David said uh, to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day will the Lord deliver you into my hand, I will smite thee and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God of Israel. I think that was David's secret weapon. He had tremendous faith in God. That's right. Even at a young age, he trusted that whatever he said he was going to do, he did. Yep. So David never questioned it. He just did it. You said, you said it there. It. Yeah. Well, what is the lesson for us thinking about David as a soldier? A heart of courage. We need to have courage. Go to Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. 22, verse 30, Ezekiel. Here's an individual that does something unusual. 22, verse 30. And I sought for a man among that should make up the hedge, stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. Stood in the gap. I think of Joshua when they were coming through the land, uh, the uh, wilderness, uh, and there was a plague because of the disobedience. And what did Joshua do? He took a censer of fire and ran through the Israelites. The death, the plague was just kind of rolling through and, and it was a wave of death. And he reached to that circle of life and death and placed that censer of fire and he stopped the pestilence and stopped the death by standing in the gap, standing in the place, had courage. There in Ezekiel, couldn't find anybody. Just like before David got there at the battle, no one had courage to go against Goliath. And one strong man, one valiant uh, soldier could have gone down there and had the faith to kill him, but he didn't. <clears throat> uh, Go 
Hebrews 13, verse 6. What causes us to hold back? You know what? Fear. We're afraid. We're afraid of what people think of us. We're afraid we'll fail. We're afraid we don't know enough. We're afraid we'll hurt people's feelings. 13, 6. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. One version says, So that with good courage we can say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember the statement? With God, all things are possible. Uh, fear paralyzes. Go to Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Acts 4, 13. Remember when Peter and John were arrested for speaking in the name of Jesus? They were told, don't you do that anymore. Well, they were whipped and flogged. And now verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled that they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And it was all over uh, the, of the healing of the man that was uh, crippled. The Israelites didn't want to give credit. Didn't want to recognize that these men had anything to do. Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto your servants that with all boldness that they may speak the word. By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders might be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. All because two men, two disciples, two apostles, were willing to speak up. Uh, Look at verse 20. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Were they afraid? You know, fear comes upon all of us at times. Look at Acts 9, 27. Do you know, Greg, this is yeah. the same man that denied Jesus three times. You know? Yeah. Now he's learned from that experience and able to speak out boldly. We learn from our mistakes. We learn when we make problems or we, we have problems in our life, we can, we can overcome. We learn, grow, be stronger. <coughs> Next, 9.27. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming and going out of Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. And when they and but, <clears throat> which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to to Judea. Uh, here's uh, Barnabas standing up for Saul. Or Paul, uh, Barnabas didn't have to do that, did he? But he was courageous. Look at chapter 18. Barnabas did the right thing. Fear didn't keep him from doing that. 18 verse 26.
Here's Apollos, an eloquent man who only knew the baptism of John, verse 25. It says that he began to speak boldly in the synagogue whom when Aquila and Priscilla heard, they took him unto them and explained to him the way of God more perfectly or more carefully. Here's two uh, that didn't have to stand up for this other man, but they took the time and taught him privately. You know, some might say, well, here's a husband-wife team. How much did the wife say? None. I don't know. She might, she might have said yeah. things in that. They probably did if they weren't Christians. Well, they were Christians. They, were, they, they no, helped. She helped teach them if they weren't Christians. Probably. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But I think the, the understanding there is the husband yeah. is, is taking the lead and doesn't doesn't mean anything wrong if she says something. She's not usurping authority there. Uh, but they teach Apollos. Look at 19 verse 8. And went to the synagogue and spoke boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Here's, here's Paul. No, not Paul. Uh, well, verse 4. Then said Paul. Paul laid his hands upon them. Yeah, yeah Paul. it was Paul. I want to make sure. What all did Paul go through? Shipwreck. Snake Fl bite. Beatings. Floggings. Being threatened. Yeah. And and here he is going into the synagogue, going into the enemy's territory. Really, they're not enemies, but to him, Paul is an enemy to them because they considered him a, a, a one that betrayed them. But every time it says they talked boldly, it's representing that courage. Speak up. But, you know, they were also told, you know, by the Spirit, you know, go to this city and don't be afraid. Yeah. You know, the Holy Spirit told them that several times, you know, when they would go out, I want you to go here. It's okay, I'll be with you. you know. Whatever you face, whatever we face together in, in our fight for Christianity, in our proclamation, in, in fighting falsehood, denominationalism, we need to be bold, kind, speak the truth in love. But I think we can take David and uh, be encouraged, be strong, and of good courage. All right. Thanks for coming. Next time it'll be on uh, him as king, as sovereign. How well did he serve as king? All right.